This is a really good crowd. Thank you for joining us this morning. So as you all may have already read this, uh, this morning that the Minnesota House passed historic legislation last night when it passed the PRO Act. That's right. The Protect Reproductive Options Act protects Minnesotans' reproductive freedom to decide when or if to become a parent. Specifically, this legislation puts into state law the fundamental right to make autonomous decisions about your own reproductive health uh, including the right to contraceptions, the right to continue a pregnancy, and the right to have an abortion. Thank you to our chief author, Representative Katiza Watoon, Planned Parenthood, Gender Justice, Pro-Choice Minnesota, and all of our partners and supporters. This could not have been done without each and every one of you. As I stated last night, I want to remind us how, uh, how and why we are here today. Roe was the law of the land until it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Abortions are legal here in Minnesota until they are not. This is why passing the PRO Act yesterday, along with the other uh, Reproductive Freedom Caucus bills our members have put together, we'll touch, which we'll touch on in a bit, is necessary. On our watch, we let a GOP Congress refuse to confirm Supreme Court justices during Obama's administration. We allowed an extremist president to appoint conservative justices. And we watched why those justices lied about their belief that Roe did not need to be codified because it was the law of the land. In this election, voters told us they will not be fooled, which is why reproductive rights was the most talked about issue at the doors. I know this because I door knocked from the North Shore to Moorhead to Mankato and all around the Metro. We took copious notes in our system and in reviewing the information, it was very clear to us that Minnesotans cared about their ability to choose for themselves and their family members to do so for those who have uteruses and those who can make decisions on what happens to their body around reproductive rights. Uh, Democrats winning the majority in both chambers, voters empowered us to ensure people continue to have the ability to make medical decisions for themselves. We've been hearing from our opponents that our agenda is extreme. Let me tell you what is extreme. We deny women and BIPOC people equal pay for equal work. We refuse to implement systems where everyone has the right to affordable health care. We reduce safety net programs that will help struggling families. We won't invest in high quality and affordable child care. We refuse to acknowledge and afford equal rights to our trans community. And we ignore the housing crisis and the important role this plays in raising a family. We stack the odds against anyone who wants to start a family. And then when someone says they cannot bring a child into this world, we demonize them. That is extreme. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This year, we will celebrate the 50th anniversary of Roe. To honor this important milestone, I proudly stand with my co-chair, Senator Lindsey Port, and our caucus members standing behind me today to ensure that Minnesotans continue to have bodily autonomy, to make decisions for themselves. With the support of our leaders, Majority Leader Dietzik and Speaker Hortman, we will continue to move the PRO Act, Reproductive Freedom Codification Bill, and the Reproductive Freedom Defense Act. Thank you for being here today to listen to our members and what we have to share about our agenda. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Sarah Traxler to speak to the need for the full slate of bills we are proposing. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm Dr. Sarah Traxler, Chief Medical Officer at Planned Parenthood North Central States. I am proud to provide abortion to my patients, along with a broad spectrum of essential health care services, like cancer screenings, STI testing and treatment, contraception, and annual exams. As a doctor, every day when I walk into my health center, I know my patients will come to their appointments from all walks of life. Some are already parents. Some are scared. Most of them have questions. And every single one of them is unique. Like my patient, a mother of three, who was struggling to make rent and needed to make sure that she could take care of the children that she already has. Or my patient, who drove nine hours to see me because her local doctors would not take care of her, even though she was given a lethal fetal diagnosis. While no two patients are the same, I know that all patients deserve to control their bodies and their futures. Since overturning of Roe v. Wade, Planned Parenthood North Central States has seen a 13% increase in patients coming from out of our region for abortion care, and we've seen a 40% increase in those needing second trimester abortions. Abortion is essential health care. That's right. Mm -hmm. States with strong access to abortion have lower maternal mortality rates, lower infant death rates, improved prenatal care access, and higher contraception uptake. I see the reality every, t every day of people forced to travel out of state for abortion care. Minnesota's abortion access is critical right now for Minnesotans 
and for people across the country. We need the PRO Act so that Minnesotans and all patients know that they are welcome here. We must reassure them that Minnesota supports them and our commitment to their reproductive rights and health care will not change. Health care providers need that reassurance too so that we know that our medical and ethical obligations to care for our patients are not restricted by politics. Minnesotans deserve to make their own health care decisions based on science and with experts, not politicians or judges. By passing the Protect Reproductive Options Act and codifying reproductive rights into state law, Minnesota can become a national leader for reproductive freedom and equity. Passing the PRO Act would be a historic step in the right direction and makes makes me hopeful for future Minnesotans, knowing that future generations will have the bodily autonomy and freedom they deserve. But we shouldn't stop there. We shouldn't stop with just the PRO Act. Mm -hmm. We also need to repeal all the unconstitutional and antiquated laws that are currently on the books and pass legislation, the Reproductive Freedom Codification Act, that protects patients that travel to Minnesota to receive care and protects the providers, my colleagues and me, who provide that care. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Senator Lindsay Port. I represent District 55 in Burnsville and Savage, and I am the Senate Chair of the Reproductive Freedom Caucus. I thank you so much for joining us today as we acknowledge the 50th anniversary of the, of the Roe versus Wade decision. We heard from voters across our districts since the decision to overturn that landmark precedent that Minnesotans want us to protect the right to abortion access. And we have been hard at work doing just that. I wanna start by congratulating my colleagues in the House for the passage of the PRO Act, the first step towards codifying abortion access for all Minnesotans. The Senate will hear the PRO Act hopefully this coming week, and we are excited that the Reproductive Freedom Codification Bill and the Reproductive Freedom Defense Act have begun their journeys through committee, the committee process in both chambers. The Reproductive Freedom Caucus continues our important work to ensure that all three bills in the abor abortion care codification package pass quickly to ensure that Minnesotans and our neighbors from other states and our providers are all protected. We believe that it takes all three bills being signed into law. We thank Speaker Hortman and Leader Dietzik for their support and encourage them to continue their work with the same energy that they have led us with thus far. Codifying access to abortion care has been the central focus of our caucus over the last year. However, our work is far from done. Throughout the interim, we've formed small groups focused on various reproductive freedom issues researched and had discussions in our communities and in this building about our priorities. And today we unveil our broader agenda for the 2023 session. The work ahead of us can be divided into three themes, healthy parents and healthy children, bodily autonomy and gender freedom, and protecting and expanding access to abortion care. The healthy parents, healthy child, children theme includes issues such as paid family leave, comprehensive sex ed, and maternal health. Bodily autonomy and gender freedom focuses on issues including the ERA, the conversion therapy ban, and ensuring access to gender affirming care. Our work on abortion access continues with a protecting and expanding access to abortion care theme with work on sustainable Medicare rates and equitable coverage, investing in the training of new providers, and ensuring that any hospital systems merger protects reproductive freedom access. I wanna thank my colleagues in the RFC one more time and say that I am incredibly proud to be a part of this group and the important work that we're doing together to ensure that every Minnesotan can have bodily autonomy and reproductive freedom. And I'll introduce Dr. Senator Kelly Morrison. <laughs> 
Good morning. Thank you all very much for being here. I'm State Senator Kelly Morrison, and I could not be more proud to stand with my fellow members of the Reproductive Freedom Caucus to talk about our legislative priorities. I want to thank the chairs of our caucus, Senator Port and Representative Herr, for their leadership and this incredible team that make up our caucus, and the advocates and Minnesotans who have worked so hard to protect these rights for everyone. As Rep. Her and Senator Port said, we have immediate and necessary priorities around protecting and expanding access to abortion care, given the landscape our country finds itself in after the Supreme Court overturned 50 years of precedent and for the first time took rights away rather than expanding them. Yesterday was an exciting day uh, and an exciting first step when the House passed the PRO Act off the floor. Next stop is the Senate floor and then onto the governor's desk to be signed into law. We will both protect and expand access to abortion care in Minnesota this year. But our broader legislative agenda is guided by the tenets of reproductive justice, a movement founded and led by black women, that people have the right to decide whether and when to become a parent, and if they do decide to become a parent, to have the ability to raise that child in a safe and thriving community. That is true reproductive freedom. And to support reproductive freedom, our caucus has a series of legislative goals, and I will speak to healthy parents, healthy children. Reproductive freedom, of course, begins with understanding our own bodies and how they work. That is why we support comprehensive sex ed that is age appropriate and scientifically accurate to empower kids to, with knowledge about their own bodies, how they work, how to protect themselves, and how to care for themselves. We know that we have unacceptable racial disparities in maternal infant morbidity and mortality in Minnesota. To support healthy parents and healthy children, we must ensure that people have access to excellent prenatal, labor and delivery, and postpartum care. Last session, we successfully passed legislation to extend medical assistance to 12 months postpartum so new moms and their families can access that, the care they need. Given those disparities that I referenced, uh, given our mental health crisis, given our substance use disorder crisis, this is essential. We also, uh, uh, sorry, I can't read my small writing here. <laughs> we, we also ensured that new moms can access an early postpartum visit, um, and we exempted providers of prenatal care from being mandatory reporters. We must stop policing pregnant people and start helping them get the care they need to optimize pregnancy outcomes. We will redirect tax dollars from crisis pregnancy centers, so-called, that in many cases provide inaccurate, incomplete, and misleading information to programs that support prenatal care, mental health counseling, and other public health programs. And finally, we support paid family leave in the Reproductive Freedom Caucus mm -hmm. so that people can have the time to recover from pregnancy, to welcome a new child through adoption, or to care for an ill family member. As an obstetrician gynecologist myself, I have seen far too many times patients who have had to return to work against medical advice because they have no option but to work. They cannot afford to not be paid. Um, thank you so much for being here. We're excited about our agenda, and I will now turn it over to Representative Finke. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> my name is Lee Finke. My pronouns are she, her, and I represent District 66A. And I am also the chair of the DFL House Queer Caucus. I want to thank the Reproductive Freedom Caucus for recognizing the crucial intersections of the, re the reproductive freedom movement and the fight for queer liberation. The values of bodily autonomy, privacy, choice, and healthcare accessibility are shared by so many in Minnesota. Acting on those values is why we are here. To that end, the legislative agenda of the Reproductive Freedom Caucus includes several priorities related to the Queer Caucus, including Representative Holland's conversion therapy ban bill, the creation and protection of safe and inclusive school facilities and school activities and sports, which is being led by Representative Kozlowski, and my bill to establish a statewide safe haven for trans families and gender expansive families across the nation in search of a safe home for gender affirming care. Gender affirming care must also be established and protected in the state of Minnesota. 
As has previously been said, we must also protect rights that we already have that face new threats, such as protecting access to contraception and family planning special projects. All of these priorities are essential to the LGBTQ2S plus community and our families across the state. Likewise, the queer community recognizes and shares the essential goals of the Equal Rights Amendment to guarantee the equality of all Minnesotans. Our fights are one fight. Queer liberation depends fully on the success of the movement for black lives, on the indigenous rights movement, on the disability rights movement, and on the vital work of this Reproductive Freedom Caucus. Thank you. Hello, my name is Hannah Edwards, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm here today as the parent of an amazing 12-year-old transgender girl. My daughter is funny, she's creative, she loves to perform and sing, and she's the best big sister around. Not to brag too much, but she was also the youngest Grand Marshal in Twin Cities Pride history last <laughs> summer. I'm, right, exactly. I'm thankful each and every day, though, that we live in Minnesota, a place where our family can access affirming health care for our child without fear that the government is coming after us following the, ex following the expert advice of my child's care teams. As the parent of a trans kid, you quickly learn to network and share resources in order to get what your kid needs. It's what we at Transforming Families do best, and the last legislative session was heartbreaking as we watched our networks of families across Minnesota and the country have to have their children attacked for political gain. We know families who live in Texas whose children were pulled out of class at school by DCFS to begin abuse investigations. Families in Arkansas whose kids are losing access to their doctor prescribed medications that they've taken for years. And families in Florida who are forced to send their kids to schools that pretend LGBTQIA 2S people don't exist. Healthcare is a human right, and care decisions should remain between doctors, parents, and children. However, many families like ours are now scared to take their kid to the doctor, or even to let anyone know that their child is transgender. In 2022, these anti-trans and anti-science laws have been forcing families into hiding. So many states have already proposed and pre-filed bills that are attacking LGBT community, trans adults, and drag performers, but many of these bills upwards of 80% of them have especially and specifically targeted transgender youth and their families. Attacks are being made to eliminate these kids' humanity and track their movements, like recent actions in Florida, and criminalize parents and caregivers for following the best practice advice of every major medical and psychological organization. I'm proud to live in Minnesota, where people like the Reproductive Freedom Caucus are including trans ch children and their families in their agenda. In the current political climate, it is important to support the entire agenda of the Reproductive Freedom Caucus. So I just want to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then Erin McQuaid is next. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm Senator Erin May Quaid. I represent Senate District 56, Apple Valley, Rosemount Egan. As I learn more about disability justice, I'm going to describe myself. I'm a black biracial woman with long brown hair. I'm wearing a cream shirt, red lipstick, and black glasses. We are living in post-Roe America. For 50 years, Americans across this country had the protection of Roe v. Wade to access abortion care if and when they needed it. As someone mentioned earlier, when the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, it was the first time in, 50, or in our entire country's history, excuse me, that they have taken away a right, not protected or expanded it. I want to level set and say three things. Abortion is safe. It is safer than having a tooth extracted. It is safer than having a colonoscopy. All three are very safe. Abortion is just the safest. <laughs> abortion is common. One in four people with uteri will have an abortion in their lifetime. Abortion is health care. It is an essential part of pregnancy care. And every pregnant person that does not have access to the full spectrum of pregnancy care, including abortion care, is in increased danger. And this includes every person who lives in the states surrounding Minnesota, Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wisconsin, where they have either banned, planned to ban, or ceased providing abortion care. 
Minnesota has the opportunity to be a beacon of compassion and care in post-Roe America. And I want to say that the day that the Roe v. Wade was overturned, the Reproductive Freedom Caucus actually had a press conference to announce our agenda. We have been organized and planning and preparing for this moment for more than a year. So Minnesota was ready, and that is why you are seeing fast action on the PRO Act. It's why you're seeing fast action on the Reproductive Freedom Codification Act, and it's why you're seeing fast action on the Reproductive Freedom Defense Act. And it's why you're going to see fast action on this broader agenda. Healthy parents, healthy children, expanding access and protecting access to abortion care, and gender freedom and bodily autonomy. Part of expanding access to abortion care means training for providers. Too many providers do not have training in all of pregnancy care providing, meaning people are more in danger even in states where they can access care. It means making sure we have sustainable Medicaid rates for abortion care services. And it means that we have to ensure that hospital mergers protect reproductive freedom. Abortion can no longer be singled out and separated from the broader movement to support healthy parents and children, to support our families, to raise our families in safe and sustainable communities. We know that every single person needs access to the health care that they need. It shouldn't be determined by the health insurance they have, where they live, their zip code, race, or income level. As the first black mother ever elected to the Minnesota State Senate, we know that abortion bans across the country are going to lead to increased maternal mortality and morbidity rates, and particularly high for black women and femmes. So I'm proud to stand with this Reproductive Freedom Caucus. I thank our chair, Senator Port, and Representative Herr for bringing us together to advance this robust legislation to make sure that Minnesota stands out amongst our neighbors and amongst states to be a beacon of compassion and care so that every Minnesota can get the care that they need. Thank you. We can take questions. Um, you mentioned the increasing rates in second trimester abortion. Can you talk about that and why you think that is occurring? I um, absolutely. I can talk about that at, at nauseum. I'll try not to. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things that we see when patients are experiencing barriers to um, abortion access is that it takes significantly more time for them to pull resources, to get childcare, to coordinate time off of work, to um, logistically plan travel and places to stay. And so anytime you put a barrier in place, there's going to be a delay. And the more barriers you put in place, the longer the time frame is going to be where they can access that care. So what we've been seeing is that as the time accumulates that someone has to take in order to coordinate their care, it pushes them further into pregnancy. So that's why. Is there a correlation between your, your corresponding increase in out-of-state? I mean, are these out-of-state people who are coming in? Um, not all of them are out of state, but certainly most of them are. Dr. Trexler, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the state of things on the ground right now and how much the PRO Act and these other provisions could change that. So the state of the, the state of play today here in Minnesota is that we have several abortion providers, including Planned Parenthood, who have really worked hard in coalition together to prepare for the fall of Roe. And so we have, over several months and um, a year, you know, have been anticipating that that was going to be the outcome. And so we've been working together to coordinate how we might be able to see a larger influx of people from out of state. And that means that not only do we have to provide care for people who are not from Minnesota, but we also need to continue to be able to have care and access for our patients in Minnesota. And so we have increased our resources, expanded the facilities in which we provide abortion, expanded telemedicine abortion, started providing abortion pills via Mail for our Minnesota residents. And so we've really been innovative in how we coordinate care so that we can you know, make more space for people coming from elsewhere. Can I add one thing? Of course. One of the other things that's part of the landscape right now is that with Roe being gone, the, lands the legal landscape is incredibly confusing, and it's a patchwork of state by state, and we've seen actually attempts to ban abortion via municipalities. And so we see providers having to turn to lawyers before they can provide care. Mm -hmm. We know that people aren't sure if they can access care, which is part of why repealing uh, the laws are so important, so that there's not ambiguity about what laws are in effect and what which ones aren't. And then we have this weird legal landscape, too, where states are passing laws that allow private 
citizens, to sue other private citizens, to sue providers, which is why the Reproductive Freedom Defense Act is so important so that providers in this state know that when they provide legal care here, they will be protected and able to continue to provide care. So one of the things that um, Representative uh, Katiza Wathun last night in her uh, closing remarks said is that none of the, the, the amendments Republicans were trying to tack on were things uh, that uh, aren't already happening or, or that, that the, the current law already allows everything that they're trying to, to remove. Is that correct, the, the current state? I don't know. I don't watch it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm here. Yes, that is correct. And I think that uh, what we're trying to do is protect the current rights that uh, people with uteruses uh, and those who can make decisions for themselves on reproductive rights, that they continue to have those same rights. So we're not adding anything or taking anything away. I will just add that um, many of the restrictions that Minnesota had on abortion were ruled unconstitutional over mm -hmm. the summer. And that is the work of the reproductive Freedom. Freedom codification bill. She's going to get me to say it right at some point. <laughs> uh, that is why it's critical that we pass those, because those have been ruled unconstitutional, but they are still on the books. So we need to remove those. There's also um, statutes on the books that were ruled unconstitutional under Roe. And now that Roe has fallen, those are in question. So that that is that speaks to the reason why passing that bill is so critical, so that hospital systems and providers are not checking with lawyers before providing care, that there's a clear landscape um, here in Minnesota. We heard, sorry, we heard a lot of Republicans last night to point to the fact that the legislation is very extreme, it lacked guardrails. I'm wondering if someone can speak to that um, and whether that's accurate compared to what's actually happening out there now. Go ahead. So part of that rhetoric is meant to paint people who have abortions as confused people who don't know what they're doing, who don't know their own decision making, who need the government to tell them what's happening in order for them to make a different decision. And that's just not accurate. Two thirds of Minnesotans who have abortions are parents already. They know what pregnancy entails. They know what giving birth entails. They know what parenting entails. We know that pregnancy care is part of health care. We do not regulate any other health care the way that we tackle abortion. There, my bill is like 50 pages long because it is littered with unconstitutional statutes singling out abortion care. What is extreme is forcing people to give birth against their will. What is extreme is forcing people to carry fetuses that might have died in utero because you disagree with the method of removing it from the uterus so that they live and don't have sepsis and die. What is extreme is forcing people into poverty because they can't afford more children. What is extreme is opposing health care for every single person. What's extreme is opposing paid family medical leave. I mean, they are incredibly extreme in their positions, and they have to resort to increasing <laughs> inflammatory rhetoric to make us seem like we're extreme for providing basic health care to Minnesotans. That's right. Yes. Yeah. My name is Erin Murphy, uh, and I serve in the Minnesota Senate. Uh, Right after the Dobbs decision was delivered, we were here in this room behind this podium together. I was standing next to Representative Sidney Jordan. We were asked the question, what would be different in this election? Because abortion has never played the pivotal role that people hope for in an election. And I answered the question, and then Representative Jordan answered more clearly than I. <laughs> they stripped away a right. They stripped away a right. And over the next months, Minnesotans made very clear that they objected to that, which has brought us to this moment. And we understand the job that we need to do for the people of Minnesota and all of the provisions that this caucus are talking about. Each of those buckets are important in the follow through, in the commitment that we made to the people of Minnesota and in protecting reproductive freedom. You can see in this room right now joy, you can feel hope, but I hope you feel the sheer determination of this caucus and that we will not leave this session without completing this work. We are talking about autonomy, we're talking about human rights, we are talking about private medical decisions. Those are not negotiable. And what we have seen over these last painful weeks in the hearings that have moved forward so far is an effort on the part of our opponents to try and negotiate over those fundamental rights. Okay. And let us be clear that we will not leave this session with the negotiation over those rights. Our ability to lead 
freely live, freely make decisions about our bodies freely for ourselves. Thank you. Is, uh, is Representative Abaje back there somewhere? No, no, no she's, she's not here today. Then you're a representative her. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the Defense Act is one we haven't spent as much time on so far. Can you uh, explain uh, what that bill does? Um, I just got a very long... Actually, I'm going to hand it over to uh, uh, Dr. Senator Morrison, who actually started that work in the House, and then she went to the Senate. She's the Senate author on the House side. <laughs> so the Reproductive Freedom Defense Act was born of what has happened in the wake of the Dobbs decision. Um, it actually started with SB 8 in Texas, uh, the law that was passed prior to the overturning of Roe versus Wade that essentially banned abortions and empowered citizens to go after each other, to sue each other. This is an unprecedented new legal landscape um, that has thrown uh, my attorney friends and judges into some confusion and turmoil, I think it's fair to say. So the intent of the Reproductive Freedom Defense Act is to protect patients who come to Minnesota from states that have restrictive reproductive health care laws, to protect them from those laws, as well as to protect our providers who provide the care for those people. So how do you do that? I mean, interstate commerce should allow someone to travel. Uh, uh, they travel to the state, they go back home, and someone tries to prosecute them. What can the state do to help that person? The state can certainly keep uh, private health care records here within the state, uh, most importantly, and refuse to cooperate with states with those kinds of laws. On the, one more question. On, on the, the abortion therapy uh, ban uh, bill, Representative Hollins, uh, when, when you presented that, uh, the, the amendments Republicans offered involved um, you know, a ban on children uh, taking medication or getting any surgeries before they're like, you know, adults, I guess, essentially. Um, what is the current state right now, and I, I'm confessing ignorance here, what's the current state of what, what can trans children get now from the medical, medical providers? I mean, I mean, somebody I can, with real I, health experience I, is probably better. I can certainly affirm the fact that children are not, we oftentimes get inappropriate questions about our child. Children are not having surgeries right? Um, at most, there's a social transition. Um, sometimes there's a puberty blocker that happens, which is just a pause on puberty. Um, and then as they get older, about 14, 15, 16, they can start talking about uh, cross-sex hormones. Um, but there's nothing that's permanent that's happening to children. Um, and it's offensive that people think so. <laughs> so, yeah. Claiming yes. yes. Oh, yes. Of course. It's said all the time. <laughs> yes, they've made a lot of claims in that committee hearing, um, <laughs> most of which were um, not most. Mo uh, they, they were wrong. They were wrong on almost every um, understanding that they were bringing about gender affirming care. But I did want to take a second to speak to the landscape. Similar question we had earlier. Um, we're doing this work to protect abortion rights because we lost that right when they overturned Roe mm -hmm. as a nation. Um, the rights of trans people and gender expansive people to access health care have not been yet ruled on, and we have the ability to do this work preemptively, mm -hmm. which, will be, which will be very necessary either way, so let's do it right now. This is the moment that we have to protect our communities, mm -hmm. um, and in, our communities are very fragile. Nationwide, we are in a position where the ability to access care, um, not only is it a patchwork, but it's a patchwork even by state. We, we do not have enough providers in the state of Minnesota. We have regions where access to gender affirming care is simply not available. Um, so we have access to care here, um, and we have access to great care. Um, but we don't have enough of it, and everyone around us needs it too. Just like with abortion, they're coming here to access that care, um, and we need to make sure we are able to provide it because that day is coming to the Supreme Court for us as well. Thank you. Can we have the members who want to get pictures?